Uh, he's currently involved with several expedition projects and is working on a documentary of his world record Ocean Road. He also shares insights on expedition leadership and team dynamics with business and community organizations. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Brad Vicker. Thank you, Greg, and to the entire uh, Maritime Museum staff and the board for pulling this together. It's louder. louder. Okay, we can do it louder. That's not even one of my friends. There we go. We have a microphone. We'll, we'll work it. Anyways, uh, thank you very much for coming out and supporting this talk. I, I would like to begin the talk with just a simple question that was running through my mind, which is why? <laughs> why on earth? would you choose to row a boat, row of all things across the North Atlantic from New York to England when there are plenty of other perfectly viable means of getting across <laughs> the North Atlantic? Well, I'll get to why. And it's, it's a good question, and it's, it's one that I can provide some of my own insight into. And hopefully, you can take away some, you can think about why you choose to take on challenges uh, that you become a part of. But let's start with what? What on earth is it that we're actually doing here? Uh, this is a 29 by 6 foot ocean rowboat. And we're about to cross the North Atlantic for upwards of two months. We're entirely unsure how long it's going to take us to get across. There are three other teams. There are three other vessels embarking on this with us. You can see them in the background there, and we actually started behind them, and then we ended up rowing through them, and that was, that was one of our goals that we had. But what we're doing is an expedition, and it ended up taking us, and here's a spoiler alert, it took us 68 days to complete the row, and an additional number of days, so here, here we are right there, completing the row at Bishop's Rock Lighthouse, and then we continued rowing an additional 70 nautical miles to get all the way into Falmouth, England. And that's actually what earned us the Guinness World Record, was becoming the first boat to row from mainland US to mainland England. I mentioned there's three other boats out there with us. This was part of a race. And we were the only American entry in the race. And one of those vessels turned around after two days. They were just physically and mentally unprepared for the task at hand. The other two vessels completed the crossing. The second place team came in six days after we did, and then another six days after that, so 12 days after we crossed the finish line, the final boat was able to make it across. So who on earth are we doing this with? What's our cast of characters that we have? Well, this is me right here, and our laser pointer's not working quite too well, so I'll point. So this is me, and I rode with all these guys in college. We were on the college rowing team, as Greg mentioned. Next to me is our team captain, Jordan Hansen, and Jordan is an interesting fellow. He was able to somehow bind us all together and unite us as a team to embark on this voyage. We've got Greg Spooner, and Greg was probably the person I clashed with the most in the months leading up to the project and out there on the water. We would butt heads probably because we were so similar in our outlook and our approach to things. Although we would never have admitted it at the time. And then our short team member coming in at five foot 10, <laughs> a short five foot 10, is, uh, is Dylan. And Dylan proved to be a strong, solid rock for me out there on the water. And, and we all served that purpose for each other numerous times. We began the voyage as friends, and many years later, we're still friends. So that's one of the things I'm very proud of in, in having pulled this off. What I want to do this evening is I want to share with you some footage from out there on the North Atlantic, and then I want to get into the journey before the expedition. Rowing across the North Atlantic took us two months. Getting to the start line in New York took us 18 months. It took us a year and a half to prepare for a two-month two -month voyage. So I'll talk a little bit about assembling a team, putting that team together, 
and then outfitting the vessel. An ocean rowboat is not the most common vessel to come by. It's not like they've just got them standing in New York and you hop on board and you start rowing. So how do we outfit that boat? How do we train and how do we prepare, prepare ourselves for rowing the North Atlantic? Then we'll actually get out onto the ocean and I'll tell you a little bit about what it's like to be out there on the ocean. How do you survive two months in a 29 by six foot space with three other people? How do you endure that? How do you endure tropical storms with 30 foot waves? How do you endure baking sun? How do you endure the just absolute bone chilling cold where you have every layer, including your dry suit on, and you're still cold? How do you row upwards of 12 hours a day? So I'll talk about the, the ocean itself, some of the creatures that inhabit the ocean that we happen to encounter, and also the creatures on board our vessel, namely the four rowers and how we interacted amongst ourselves. So with that in mind, I would like to share with you a, some uh, footage from being out there on the row. And then I'll try and do my best to answer the question, why? Why on earth did I choose to embark upon this joy, uh, voyage? I can't believe we're about to get in a rowboat and row across an ocean. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> I'm looking forward to crossing the Atlantic, be the first Americans. So you, it's, it's no holds barred. I mean, you, you play by the rules, but you race your ass off. I mean, shit, we've been preparing for a year and a half, and it's been a long year and a half. <laughs> don't want to die, I don't want to fail. But I uh, want to do it. I 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 want to race. I want to row. Circle up, boys. It's going to be fun. <laughs> In a weird, sick, masochistic sort of way, it's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, the moment we push off, you know, we'll just have the moment like, okay, I'm not going to touch land for another three months, but that'll all be uh, taken care of six weeks, seven weeks later. <laughs> I wanted to wear real shoes this morning, but I don't want them on the boat. If we need to touch my long hair, it's going to be a quick journey. <laughs> You'll be sleeping with one eye open. <laughs> Say, ready for them to be out there. Okay. Ready for him to win. All my life, I want to be a vlogger. I've been telling people my son is going to row across the Atlantic Ocean. My son is rowing across the Atlantic Ocean. This is what you get if you stop rowing. <laughs> this has been a great two-year run, please, guys. If they finish, they'll win. <laughs> I, I guess we're ready. <laughs> Cheese and butter. Frozen. Ten below. If it's not on the boat, we didn't need it. <laughs> Motivation to row fast so we don't run out of food. You know, we're actually rowing, but it's just going to be phenomenal. I love you, Dylan, so much. <laughs> There's three basic things you can do out there. Eat, row, and sleep. This is a huge risk, but the uh, biggest risk could get you the biggest reward. Oh! Welcome to the North Atlantic. <laughs> Whoa. Wind, southwest to west, 25 to 35 knots, gusting at 40. Wow, this sucks out there. <laughs> Forecast. More shit. <laughs> Good time. We've been going against the current and making almost no progress. I'd recommend having all your foul weather shit one before you come out. This cabin is eight by five feet. 
We're not eating much. We have one bag of Chex Mix. We're gonna have to uh, tighten our belts and suck it up. One bag of pretzels. Last night was absolute misery. We've got three cream cheese. It sucks for me because I took a lot of pride in uh, prepping the food and I completely failed in a way I came up majorly short. This has definitely been brutal on our bodies. We're all just hungry, constantly hungry. Woo! We're no more than three quarters of a mile away from this guy. Holy shit! <laughs> An amazing adventure. So why did we go about doing this? I'd have to say for myself, I was intrigued by the idea. I was intrigued by the fact that it may be possible to pull off a row like this and all the various components that would be necessary to make that happen. Outfitting the boat, getting a team together, keeping that team together, and then actually being out there on the open ocean. I had this idea that maybe we could do it, and then we were able to turn that into a reality that we could experience. And that, for me, is what inspired me and motivated me to do this. That was my why. And every time I got discouraged, I had this to enjoy while I was out on the ocean. That, and perhaps I read a few too many adventure books growing up. This is a poster that actually inspired our team captain, Jordan, to get that idea in his head of, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and row across an ocean. That sounds like a good thing to do. And he gave me a call, and it was in the morning. I remember it was in the morning, because if it hadn't have been, I wouldn't have known that he was sober. It was. <laughs> and he called me up and he said, Brad, you know, I, I'm thinking of rowing across an ocean, and I'd like you to do that with me. Would you be interested? They do that? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess I'm interested. Yeah, we're, we're going to have to talk about this. This is, this is going to require a bit of a commitment. And we did, and we talked about it, and we, we were drawn to the, the idea of making it happen. And we also knew that we could draw from our bonds rowing in college. We had amazing teammates. It takes a certain personality to get up at 4.30 a.m. when you're maintaining a college schedule, yeah, or, or any schedule for that matter. Um, and uh, beyond that, we, we just had a, a great team dynamic to build upon. So we, uh, we approached our teammates, and in looking at our teammates, we weren't necessarily looking for the strongest rowers or the fastest rowing score, who could bench press the most, who was the, the best rower out there on the water. We were looking for people that we wanted to spend two months with and the year and a half leading up to build, uh, building the boat and outfitting the project. So we were looking for the personality as much as we were looking for the skill set. We are trying to get the right people onto the boat and then take the boat off and, and enjoy where it was taking us. And one of our challenges is we're used to flat water rowing. There's actually ripples, so this is a fairly rough day <laughs> for us rowing. And we're trying to prepare a boat to row in conditions like this. So a lot of our planning and prep work is adapting from flat water rowing to the open ocean. Jordan, our team captain, who you got to see on there, he, he's a Viking looking one. Be a little more specific. He's a Viking looking one with the really long hair. <laughs> and he was our team captain and he was also working on a house project because it's not enough to be working on a boat project, you also need to have a house project. Except for Jordan didn't have any experience working on house projects. And I brought that fact to his attention. And he responded with, well, Brad, I grew up playing with Le Legos, so I, I figure this is the next logical step. <laughs> and in a lot of ways, it seemed like this was playing with Legos, and we were taking the next step.
as we assembled our team, we wanted to have an organization. We knew that we would be raising a lot of money, that we would be dealing with a lot of equipment. And we decided that structuring a nonprofit would be one of the best ways to go about doing that. Uh, so that was one of our educational experiences, was how do you actually form a 501c3? And how do you go about setting up a board? And we wanted to do that for a number of ways. It was going to provide our structure for which we could receive funds and we could, we could have that organization. And it was going to hopefully give the project a life beyond just our ocean realm. We also thought it would add to our credibility. We're right out of college and we're approaching people saying, we've got this great idea and we'd like you to invest in it. And no, 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 wait, wait, wait. There, there's going to be this, uh, this two foot by one foot decal that you get inside the boat. Yeah, no, trust me, it's, it's wonderful and we'll actually do it. So we needed all the legitimacy that we could have. And we also partnered with the American Lung Association of Washington. You'll see their decal on some of, um, actually the banner right there and on the boat as we ha had that outfitted. They were a charitable partner, and Jordan, our team captain, uh, his father passed of an asthma attack when Jordan was only three. And we thought it would be only fitting with such a lung-intensive sport as rowing that we have a charitable partner. And we ended up naming the boat after his father. And what initially started as an idea for, oh, great, well, we'll add to our legitimacy, we'll do some fundraising, it gave the trip a deeper sense of meaning for all of us. And we really fell into that and shared the passion with that. The other thing that you'll see in this picture is there's a boat. And that was significant for us. Until we had that boat, people weren't taking us very seriously. As soon as we got that boat, we had some skin in the game. We invested ourselves in the project, and as soon as we could demonstrate that to others, they really believed us. It was more than just four ambitious guys out of college. It was, oh wow, they may actually do this. And I think I had that realization numerous times throughout the project. We may actually do this. <laughs> in fact, that carried on into even the first day of the voyage. But this boat isn't ready to row across the North Atlantic Ocean. We, we purchased the boat over in England. It arrived in a container ship. But it's a blank hull, essentially. So we strapped some, some riggers on there. And we, we, I guess we put a website along the side so people could know what they're looking at. But beyond that, we really didn't know what we were doing. And we needed to, to outfit the boat and train ourselves. We're also in desperate need of a clothing sponsor at this point. We thought it was very important that at our official launching of the boat that we all have team uniforms. I can't remember who was in charge of actually getting the uniforms, but they were quickly replaced. I think that as a team, we were smart enough to realize we weren't smart enough by ourselves. We are smart enough to realize we weren't smart enough by ourselves. So we reached out. In short, we asked. We asked for help. And the amazing thing is that as we asked for help, people joined our team. And they had a vested interest in the outcome of us being successful on the North Atlantic. They wanted us to succeed. And it was amazing. They joined our team. They didn't have to go out there and row the North Atlantic, but they could be a part of it. And we needed a lot of help. We needed to outfit the vessel. We outfitted the vessel with solar panels. Well, why did we do that? Because we had a battery bank. We had a battery bank fueling our water maker. We had a desalinator that would pump out about six gallons of fresh water per hour. And that takes an enormous amount of energy to pump that out. We also had navigation systems on board the vessel. We had GPS. We had, we had our communication. So we had a satellite phone so we could download weather charts. So there's numerous systems, and we've got to cut into the deck of a perfectly good boat that we just invested all of our savings into and a, a few graduation gifts, somewhat to the hesitation of our parents, questioning the wisdom of such an investment. 
but invest nonetheless. Now we've got to cut into this boat because we need to fit food into the bulkheads of this vessel. We also need to go on training roads. And the boat is self-writing, as it says in the brochure, but before you go row an ocean, it's probably good to figure out, does this boat actually write itself? So we had water ballast and a dagger board, and that provided the stability for the vessel. We also had a compartment in the bow of the boat and in the stern of the boat. And the stern of the boat is where we wired all of our electronics. And the bow of the vessel is where we kept all of our extra gear, our sea anchor, our survival equipment, things that we hopefully didn't need all that often. So you can see a, a little diagram of our, of our vessel. And if, if, if you have any questions, and this thought does occur to me, um, I have saved some time at the end for questions. So if you do have questions, I will absolutely address those. So, um, so we'll get to those. So if you have any questions on how we outfitted the boat, the types of equipment that we used, and how we did that testing, um, I'd love to answer those. Also, one of the things that we didn't realize was unique about our preparation is we actually went out and did training rows. I told you this was part of a race. When we got to New York, we were the only boat that had spent more than one night on the open water. There's a reason one boat turned around after two days. So we were shocked to learn that. And whenever we would bring the boat to public events and kids, as they often will, would climb all over the vessel. We said, that's great. If your kid can break the boat, the North Atlantic would destroy that part of the boat. We want your kid to try and break this boat. Go for it. Have fun. Have fun with that. So we consulted with experts. We were smart enough to realize we weren't smart enough by ourselves. And we assembled a great team. Weather routers, navigators, those that could install equipment for us and teach us how to fix it if it broke, which it probably was going to break because it's the North Atlantic and it does that. This team right here has a clothing sponsor. They've got survival at sea training. They know how to navigate. They've got their communication systems ready. This crew right here, as soon as they finish that carbonated adult beverage, is ready to row the North Atlantic. So we find ourselves in New York. And the wind is just absolutely howling. And we're looking at this boat that's going to be our home for two months where we're going to need to row for up to 12 hours a day. And all the preparation work that we had been doing beforehand, 12 hours of rowing a day and two months in the open ocean seemed like a vacation. We were so excited and ready to go. And it wasn't to make light of the journey ahead. It was that we had put so much into the project. We were so ready to go. We were as prepared as we ever could be, or so we thought. Also, you'll notice in this picture, and you probably saw it in the video, that we're wearing water wings. And this was not to make light of our situation. It was that we were really comfortable, and we wanted to lighten up the mood just a little bit. And according to one of the people on our safety launch, we were the only team that was making jokes and having fun as we were leaving the harbor. And it's not because we thought it would be easy. We knew it would be the most challenging thing we'd ever done in our lives. We were ready. We were absolutely as ready as we could be for the physical challenge and the mental challenge. Because rowing an ocean is both a physical and a mental challenge. And I think you can see in this last picture here, I've changed physically and a little bit mentally. <laughs> it's harsh conditions. There's a couple of rules, a couple of mantras that we had for survival in, as I mentioned, a 29 by 6 foot rowing vessel. First one, one that we learned growing up, please and thank you. Please and thank you were mandatory on both for our vessel, the James Robert Hansen. And they were mandatory because 
it was a demonstration of mutual respect for our crewmates. We had a saying, I don't have to like you, but I have to love you. And we did not like each other quite often out there. But we always had to maintain mutual respect for each other. And it was really important. A please transforms a demand into a request. And it helped diffuse situations before they even became challenging. We also had conversations for the boat and conversations for land. If it's for the boat, it's productive. It's getting us towards England. If it's for land, maybe it's personal. Maybe it's assigning blame. Maybe it's airing a grievance, which are all perfectly valid for land, not necessarily on the boat. Because on the boat, we cannot go for a walk around the block to cool off. And the final one is, we not the final one, but the final one that I'm going to talk about is that we found reasons to celebrate. We celebrated the milestones along the way. And you'll, you'll see these themes come up as we talk about the creatures on board this vessel. So this is our, our rowing station that we have. And this was towards the bow of the vessel. And this is where our steering mechanism comes in. And I'll jump back and forth between these slides a little bit. Here's the stern, the rear of the boat, the bow, the front of the boat, and two rowing stations. We would sleep in the stern cabin, hopefully two at a time, but occasionally we all would have to go in there when we encountered a storm. We would row in shifts of two hours, two hours on, two hours off, two hours on, two hours off, rinse and repeat. And that was our cycle. Every fourth day, you'd switch up your rowing partner, and that's just so that you got to enjoy a different set of stories, <laughs> lies, and grievances. You could complain about your other rowing partner. <laughs> and it also maintained a sense of team unity. We wanted to be a team of four ocean rowers, not two teams of two rowers or whatever the other two are that we want to think that they are. So we wanted to keep that, that sense of uh, team unity out there. Well, what do you do when you're not rowing? You're rowing for two hours. You're, you're committed to that. You need fuel, so you're eating. Part of our training routine, getting ready for the row, is that we actually tried to gain weight. We tried to gain about 20 pounds because we knew from reading other accounts of ocean rowers that we would lose between 20 and 30 pounds. Turns out someone that was in charge of planning the food, and we'll get to this, someone in charge of planning the food, that was me, may have miscalculated. So we ended up losing quite a bit more than 20 to 30 pounds. In fact, one of our rowers lost upwards of 42 pounds. So you're trying to consume as many calories as you can, and that's, that's a lot. So what did we eat while we were out there? Of course, we had the freeze-dried options. But we also would enjoy minute polenta. We would have instant mashed potatoes, and then we'd augment that. We'd throw in some olive oil. We'd put in cheese. We'd put in vacuum-sealed tuna, because it makes sense to take a lot of fish with you when you're on a rowboat in the ocean. <laughs> and actually, that came into play. We lost a little bit of our gear when we were in New York before we left on the voyage. And we couldn't figure out what it was. And I'll let you know later on what it was that we lost, but it would have been crucial. And I've given you a bit of a hint in the fact that we, it's a good thing we brought the vacuum sealed tuna. There weren't a lot of other fish that we got throughout the entire voyage. We would also schedule it so that we had at least one warm meal every day. And that was our evening meal. And then every other breakfast would be warm. So oatmeal or grits. Grits were a favorite. Cheese. We brought over 200 pounds of cheese on this boat. <laughs> Provided really good ballast for the boat, at least. And we gave it below waterline, and it was nice and cool. And if there was mold, which occasionally there was, you just cut that off. And you're fine. You melt it in there anyways. We had a saying on board that if it was different, it was good. <laughs> because on day 45, 
And it's not, oh, great, I've got warm oatmeal. It's, oh, well, I've got oatmeal, and maybe I'll put in some emergency, because that might taste different. <laughs> we did that, and it was good, because it was different. So these are closed, cramped quarters. On your two hours off, you need to eat, and we need to know where we're going. So we should check our navigation, and that's really important. We also had a website going this entire time, and we could get emails. So yes, you can get email in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean. I don't necessarily recommend it, but you can do it. So we had certain responsibilities for updating our website, checking the weather reports. That was very important finding out where the other people in the race were, which at various times was more important or more depressing than it should have been. And yes, I guess you do sleep a little bit, never more than two hours at a time, unless you're on sea anchor, and we'll get to what it's like to be on sea anchor, but you've got two hours off. The point is you don't get to sleep for that full two hours. There's a lot of other responsibilities that you have. So you're perpetually sleep deprived. And it was physically painful. The voyage itself was physically painful for the first week. After that, it's amazing what the body can adjust to and acclimate. After that, it became more of a mental challenge and somehow our bodies adapted to feeling fine with cat naps as opposed to deep sleep. I don't recommend it, but it's amazing what the body can adjust to. Did I mention the quarters are cramped? They're really tight. The cabin is barely four feet across at its widest, most beamy part, and then it tapers to about a foot and a half. This is ideally how you'd like to sleep, but this is often how you would end up sleeping, with somebody's foot in your face. And this was especially what we'd have to do when we had to batten down the hatches, if we had a storm or something like that. Oh, not only do we have to sleep, but we've got to maintain ourselves. The rowers are a vital piece of equipment out there on the ocean. So you've got to brush your teeth. You need to shower, but it's not practical really to be showering every single day where you're out there. Sometimes there's a storm and then you've got to check email and my gosh, it's such a hassle. But we actually mandated that each rower shower every three to four days. <laughs> and it wasn't because we didn't want things to smell bad. They smelled terrible. It's because we were afraid of skin rashes. And that was saltwater sores and blisters can be debilitating in endurance races. And that's actually the number one reason why people pull out of endurance races is due to skin conditions. So we were very vigilant about that. We also had to wash our clothing. And uh, we let that slide every five to six days. You could get by. Things like brushing your teeth, it wasn't just, okay, I'm going to brush my teeth, or okay, I'm just going to wash some clothing, I'll check on it in a half hour. It was a half hour process that you're actively involved in, all stages of that. So you would actually plan out, okay, it's, I've got another two hour rowing shift, I have to sleep right now. And then, yeah, I, th I think I'll brush my teeth in six hours. That's actually how our days were planned. <laughs> and you can see that we're quite tired. You can see uh, from Jordan, he he's actually asleep right here. <laughs> they were joking that he'd sleep with one eye open, but he, he found a way. <laughs> one of the weirdest pictures I've got from the North Atlantic. <laughs> how many people here have ever planned a surprise birthday party? Okay, yeah, we've got some good friends. And, or, or just planned a party in general. Got a couple. So it, it can be challenging to pull all that together and not have the people, especially for a surprise birthday party, find out. So it can be challenging to pull off an event, and then a surprise event is even more challenging. Well, imagine you're going to pull a surprise birthday party on a 29 by six foot ocean rowboat. Jordan was our team captain, is, is our team captain, and his birthday was out there on the ocean. And I said we found ways to have fun and create reasons to celebrate. It was amazingly unifying for the three of us 
to be planning the surprise for Jordan. We made him a card. <laughs> At this point in the voyage, it's not easy to make a card on the ocean. It's really difficult. At this point in the voyage, we're actually rationing food. We were rationing food, and we were between half and three-quarter rations. We pulled our dessert rations, and those were highly prized. They had sugar in them, and sugar was really good. It didn't have to be different. It was just good. And we didn't really have a candle, but you know what? We had a flare. And we decided to get one of our little jet boils, and then we taped the flare to the jet boil, and we had the little card, and the entire day we just ignored Jordan on his birthday, and he was kind of upset about that. We just ignored him until the very until it got dark out. And we give him this jet boil, and it was and this is, we didn't have any alcohol on board at this point in the voyage. This is just sleep deprivation on his face. <laughs> and joy, he's happy. But perhaps the greatest danger we ever had on the North Atlantic is when Jordan tried to set off that flare and he points it directly into the cabin. <laughs> like, no, that way. But we didn't take it away from him because it was his birthday. But that was... That, to me, was one of the defining moments, is that we're tired of each other. We're upset. We're sleep-deprived. We're malnourished at this point. We're about 50 days into the journey, and we had something to tie us all together. And that was, that was really special and important, and I, I think kept us together as a team. So I've told you a little bit about the creatures on board the boat. I'd like to, we are at a maritime museum. It's probably appropriate to discuss some of the creatures that were viewing us from the ocean. Yes, I do have a shark story. We were probably about 200 miles off the coast. We're still in the phosphorescence at night where the water is just glowing and the waves are crashing over and it's glowing on the vessel and we're actually, we can see the trail of our boat going through the waves. The white water is actually, it's just, it's, it's white water, but it's at the middle of the, in the, of the night. It's absolutely unreal and amazing. We're out on deck and we're rowing and then all of a sudden we see an object coming, circling around, coming closer to the boat and then we clearly see the outline of a hammerhead shark. And it comes and boom, thumps into our dagger board. None of us tip into the water, so the shark carries on its way. It's a well-constructed dagger board. We were happy about that. Um, so that's, that's our shark story. Other than that, we did not have a lot of shark encounters. Although I think they were always lurking because there was one time we had to jettison a, a bit of moldy food, unfortunately. I was very upset about that. But we dumped some of that food into the water, and within 10 seconds of dumping that in the water, all of a sudden a four-foot shark came along and boop, gobbled it up. So they were out there. We just didn't see very many of them. But the hammerhead we clearly saw at night, and it was an absolutely amazing and surreal experience. We did encounter a blue whale, and this was my view of the blue whale. It actually came up alongside the boat. It was very misty one morning. We're kind of covered in fog, and then all of a sudden I noticed something moving in the water, and then <laughs> I'm absolutely covered in shrimp scent. <laughs> very close encounter with nature and it, it's, it's incredible just the, the sheer size of the creature and it, excuse the crude <laughs> diagram I'm not sure if it's scientifically accurate or to scale <laughs> but it was easily twice the size of our vessel ten times it, it was massive, massive creature and just to be that close to it was unreal. This is, this does not do justice to what we experienced with dolphins on the North Atlantic. 
we saw what looked like boiling water on the horizon. And then we heard it before we really knew what it was. And we heard just a lot of high-pitched pinging. And then our boat was completely enveloped, engulfed by a stampede of dolphins. And it was what they refer to as a super pod of dolphins and literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of dolphins. And from what I've heard, it's, it's a bit of a, they're chasing after food and occasionally pods will come together and form a super pod. Uh, we haven't been able to do too much research on it. So if anyone does know more on super pods of dolphins, I'd love to, to hear more about that because it was, the water was quite literally boiling with dolphins. And that was, that was absolutely amazing. So not only did we incur, encounter the creatures in the ocean, the ocean itself was a bit of a character that we had to contend with. About, ten day, uh, about eight days into our voyage, we started receiving weather reports that tropical storm Alberta was going to come across our path. And we weren't quite sure what that meant. We saw the weather forecast and started out just at 50 knots, maybe 20 foot waves. And then it kept building and building and building. And we said, well, let's control what we can control. We can't control the conditions that we're going to be enduring, but we can strap everything to the deck of the boat. So that's what we did. We strapped everything to the deck of the boat. And we can control ourselves, and we can just trust in our equipment, trust in our training. And part of our equipment is a sea anchor. And this is a sea anchor. It's sort of like a parachute. It's nine feet in diameter. You deploy it from the bow of the vessel. And you've got a little trip line. And as the waves built and the seas grew, the winds were in excess of 70 knots and the waves were easily in excess of 30 feet, which is one foot larger than our vessel. <laughs> we were in mountain ranges of water, and all we could do was ride out the storm and trust our equipment. And we were very fortunate. Uh, we had a very well-made boat, and we didn't capsize. And we endured 18 hours in, the, in our cabin, which we had turned into a sauna or a steam room. <laughs> Eventually, I got so tired of being in there that I just put on my dry suit and sat out on deck for the final four hours before the seas had calmed enough for us to be able to row. And when we were rowing, we were still rowing down 15-foot faces of waves, but it had calmed enough, and we just wanted to do anything but be in that cabin. So even though we weren't rowing, we really didn't get sustained sleep. It was, it was pretty stressful. But the skies did clear, the storm cleared, and we were able to continue on. And as we were rowing, we, we would average between two and three knots, and we'd average between 50 and 70 miles a day. A really, really good day was 100 miles. I think we broke 100 miles three times. A really, really bad day we rode the entirety of the day and we went backwards seven miles. Talk about discouraging. Talk about needing to find a reason to celebrate something, anything. Certainly not going to be going back seven miles, my goodness. So as we endured storms on the ocean, there was a bit of a storm brewing on board our vessel. And that is that we consulted many experts. One of those experts was not a nutritionist. We double-checked many of our systems. We were in a rush packing our food. And as I realized on the docks in New York, my goodness, we miscalculated. We've got, oh, there's 49, not 70 full rations of food here. Our plan, our, our race requirements said, have 100 days worth of food. 
<laughs> 100 days, uh, will be done in half that, 50, 40 maybe. Let's, let's go for 40. A little bit of ego got in the way of rational thought on this. But our plan that we decided upon as a team is we are going to have 70 full days worth of food and 30 half days, half rations. Those will be fine. We won't ever need those. We'll laugh at it when we get to England that we brought so much extra food. Well, it turns out we didn't have an extra. We had about a day or maybe an hour's extra worth of food when we got into England. And none of the boats that made it across in our year on the race, none of them had extra food. All of them had to ration food. And one of those boats actually went two full days on the open ocean without food. Of course, that doesn't help our perspective. When I'm running around the dock, grabbing up extra food, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. I, I researched this, I know what food to get. No, you, you guys go have fun with your friends and family and loved ones. I'm, I'm just gonna fix this food all by myself because I know the most about it. I've been using I a lot and that was one of the problems. As soon as it was realized that we had a shortage of food, should have called an emergency team meeting and said, you know what, you can spend time with your friends and family, but it's going to be at Costco. Come on, get in the van, let's go. We're going. But instead I figured, you know what, I've got us into this, I'll get us out of it. And I'm running around and I'm getting freeze-dried meals from the British teams, the ones that ended up rationing food themselves, because they thought that they had too much, that they wouldn't need it. That's their assumption. My assumption is, oh, it's a freeze-dried meal. Freeze-dried meal is a freeze-dried meal. Uh-uh. Our freeze-dried meals had about 1,500 calories in them. They're the big family ones that you get. They're nice. They're great. The British ones, not so much. And it wasn't until we were actually out on the open ocean that we realized these things have maybe two or 300 calories a piece. So... How do you tell your teammates that the project they worked 18 months on for, that needs to be an unassisted row across the North Atlantic, otherwise you get disqualified from the race, how do you tell them that you might not finish because you didn't bring enough food? Well, the answer for me is I waited three days. <laughs> I was terrified. I realized on day 14, I kind of had an inclination around day 10. I saw how we were consuming food and realized I had miscalculated. On day 14, I have to tell them because that way they can make a decision. Because maybe we'll get to England in 60 days and they'll look around and say, that's weird, I thought we had 100 days worth of food on this boat. How come there isn't any food left? I'll say, oh yeah, funny story. <laughs> Or we get to day 60 and we're out of luck and we don't have the choice to make that we can ration and stretch our food because we don't have enough to do that. On top of that, someone now has to come resupply us with food. Or, oh yeah, that thing that got knocked in the water back in New York, yeah, that, that was our fishing gear. So we also don't have the fishing gear. And we realized we didn't have the fishing gear when we saw our first school of fish go past the boat. Oh yeah, great, go get the fishing gear. Couldn't find the fishing gear. Oh yeah, that's what got knocked in the water. Your world is a 29 by six foot ocean rowboat. That's your world for two months. The rest of the people in the world are the three other people on board that boat. You now have to tell them something that is going to make the rest of the world hate you. <laughs> and it's your obligation to tell them, because if you don't, not only are your lives going to be in danger, but the lives of others that are going to have to resupply you, maybe. So yeah, it took three days to work up the courage. I finally worked up the courage and I approached our team captain and I said, hey, uh, Jordan, yeah, I've got something to tell you. You're not going to like it. And we're going to need to tell the rest of the team. 
So we were able to broach that subject with the team. And it was really interesting how the different team members took that news and then took the rationing of food. Jordan, our team captain, amazing, solid as a rock, right when I told him. Dylan, who would be my solid rock throughout the end of the voyage, could barely speak to me, furious with me. His anger lasted about two days, and then he got the anger out and said, well, you know what? You did one thing really poorly, and we're suffering for that, but you, got, you were part of getting us here. You deserve to enjoy this as much as we do. Let's, let's keep working on this. Let's, me being mad at you is not going to make me any less hungry. In fact, when I'm angry, I'm more hungry, so let's, let's not be angry anymore. Jordan, who was incredibly solid for me for the first couple of days, kind of went off the deep end after a while. Started talking about food. Every meal in every restaurant he had ever enjoyed, he thought would be a good idea to share with us. And I can't really say much to the guy because I'm the reason he's so darn hungry in the first place. So we all took it at various, in various ways at various times. I think the key is that when one of our teammates was at their low, the other one was able to bring them back up so we can maintain a certain sense of equilibrium. One of the other things that we did is we maintained please and thank you throughout it. We maintained that mutual respect for each other. And we also inventoried the boat. Because once we inventoried the boat, we're dealing with numbers as opposed to emotion. It's becoming objective. So we can look through and say, how much food do we have? Not how hungry are you? How much food we have is a numeric value. How hungry are you is a very emotional value. And that's a conversation for land. On land, we could discuss how hungry we were. On the boat, how many packets of food do we have? On land, we could assign blame, preferably over a cold beer and some warm food. That was the hope, anyways. So we continued on, and we we decided as a team that we would ration food. Once we had inventoried all of our food, we realized we, we just have enough food. To, we can get to England if we ration. And we go to three-quarter rations for most days. Occasionally, we'll have a really hard rationing day that we'll do at half, but we'll space those out. And then a few times, we'll have full rations. So we came up with a plan. We put it together. And what really kept me together, and I think kept us together as a team, is we experienced hunger, but we chose to be hungry. I've had a lot of time to think about being hungry. And it occurs to me that there are two times when you ration food, for survival or for opportunity. And we were rationing for opportunity. We wanted to be part of the race. We wanted to do that unassisted. We had a choice in the matter, and that gave us strength, knowing that we made that choice. So that was a, an insight that we gained out there. So what do you think about when you're not coming up with your rationing plan and how much you want to throw the guy overboard that got you in the mess in the first place? But then you get to eat his food, but you've got to row his mile. So we'll keep him on board, but uh. <laughs> This is what you think about most of the time. <laughs> every aisle of every supermarket you've ever been through the Trader Joe's on Milpas, oh my gosh, I walked those aisles in my mind so many times. Just about every market in Seattle, that's what goes through your mind. When you're not distracted by Jordan t telling you about an amazing restaurant that he's been to or having a meal with monks from wherever, he travels a lot, it's kind of fun. So as we're going through, one of the things I mentioned that kept that sanity amongst us as a team is that we came up with reasons to celebrate. So one thing that we did is we, we looked at our food as we're re-inventorying and we realized, oh, we've, we've got a thousand miles to go and we've got 10 really nice freeze-dried meals left. Which is not 10 individual meals, it's 10 days worth, so that's 40 meals. So that 
gives you the sense of the scale that we're, we're dealing with. Well, we really enjoy these meals, so how about, let's do a countdown. So every 100 miles at the 900 mile mark, 800 mile mark, 700 on through, we had something to really look forward to. So we were celebrating those mile markers that we had along the way. And you know what? It was something that instead of talking about how hungry we were, we talked about how forward we were looking to our next really good freeze-dried meal. That's going to be amazing. Another fun thing that we had is uh, every Friday was Gumbo Friday. Because <laughs> why not? <laughs> so it was little reasons to celebrate that, that really kept us going. And if we had waited till we got to the finish line to celebrate, it would have been an absolutely miserable journey. Incredibly miserable. <laughs> but we did make it to the finish line. And we made it to the finish line, which is this really it's an imaginary line. It's a line of it's a line of longitude. <laughs> That's just drawn. It's two waypoints, and you cross it on your GPS. And it's you, you've been doing this countdown to it. You're anticipating it, and then you get there, and you're still in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> We're surrounded by water. It's not like this is taken from land. We're 30 miles off the coast of England as we cross the finish line of the race. So we still had a ways to go. But we had achieved our first, our primary objective, which is we wanted to, we, we wanted to cross the ocean in the fastest and safest way possible, and in doing so, win the race. So we had achieved that, and we felt incredible about that. But we still had another 70 miles to go, because our secondary objective is we want to make landfall. And one of the, one of the amazing things that I'll, I'll never forget, and it's more of a sensation, is we were able to smell land before we could see it. For two months, we had been surrounded by the sounds and the scents of the ocean. And then all of a sudden, there's something different, which is good, because it's different. <laughs> and it's really good because it smells like damp, moist, Earth, mixed in with cow dung. <laughs> but we were so happy when we could smell that, and then we could see land, and we were overwhelmed with a sense of accomplishment and joy, and to be perfectly honest, almost a certain amount of dread. This had been our purpose for so many days, for so many months. For two years, this is what we woke up in the morning and we're, we're doing. What are you doing? I'm rowing across an ocean. Oh, that's interesting. This was our purpose, our identity. And all of a sudden, we're five miles away from having to seriously reevaluate our, our purpose and find a, a new objective. And that was a very difficult transition coming back onto, onto land. That doesn't mean we rode any slower. We rode as quickly as we could into Falmouth Harbor. And I think it's the sounds that was amazing. The docks lined with friends and family that we hadn't seen for two months or even years, as the case may be. And complete strangers just decided to, that this was significant and they wanted to share in it with us. We hadn't even asked them to help us outfit the boat. They just were excited about what we we're doing. And they're cheering, and they're yelling, and they're excited, and they're jubilant. And we get about this close to the dock, and it just goes silent. Nothing. I'll never forget it. It's, it was absolutely incredible. And I think at that point, I really knew we were going to get across the North Atlantic. <laughs> I knew we were going to make it to the dock. <laughs> so I've really enjoyed sharing this adventure with all of you.